material. Um, so the film um, came out about um, a few years ago, in uh, November uh, 2012. I was um, I received a phone call from um, John Basek, who's the producer of the film, who um, asked me would I be interested in uh, directing a film on Brando because they had um, access to the uh, uh, to the, uh, the Brando family estate um, as um, had approved the film of um, uh, of some form and um, and included in that was a, the, the access to this archive material um, but there wasn't it wasn't sort of that clear at the beginning how much archive there in fact was going to be um, I had um, a handful of tapes which were fascinating audio tapes originally that I listened to which um, sent me along um, to thinking um, wow it would be amazing if more of these tapes um, became available and uh, they were unpacking more of the archive at the time um, you know there's more this you know if we had enough material then how fantastic it would be to tell the entire story in Marlon's own words um, because he'd um, been um, you know such a uh, remained such a mystery to people through the course of his life and you know had been so private that you know and had been in his own um, mind misrepresented that it would be amazing for him to um, um, solve the question that everyone had been asking, like who was the real Marlon Brando? Were most of these tapes based on the hypnotisms? Uh, no, no, there, no, not, uh, there were self-hypnosis tapes, okay. um, but they weren't the majority. Uh, they didn't form the majority of the material. It was probably it was difficult to estimate. I'd say certainly, you know, uh, more than three hundred hours of material okay. um, included in that were, were um, self-hypnosis tapes. Um, which were, um, you know, very um, revealing and and um, intimate, and you know, were handled with a lot of you know, sensitivity in the in the edit. Um, but um, but you know, form part of the form part of the story. There was lots of you know, he recorded takes for many different reasons. He had um, he would do creative preparations for his characters and. Um, you know, do hours and hours of recording and preparing for many of his major film roles. Um, he would have just private musings, you know, um, notes to self, to-do lists, um, uh, tapes of um, thoughts, ideas, vocabulary. Um, he would have um, uh, tapes from uh, business meetings, you know, that he was, he'd record meetings with producers and Hollywood execs just to see that he was covered. Um, and uh, he would uh, do um, takes with his family as well, uh, with his kids, record them, get them to come out to the microphone and, and speak in there for posterity. Stephen, was there anything you were surprised about as a director, knowing his life, hearing what it's like and hearing his thoughts? Um, I just, um, I mean, everything was a surprise in as much as I, I didn't know really anything about him to start off with. And I knew, I think, you know, a classic actor. Yeah, I knew. I mean, he was he was responsible for a lot of the, my favorite films, and he was in, you know the uh, he 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 um, he was an actor uh, who uh, uh, I was aware, but I didn't know much about his private life. I mean, I I knew I guess the stuff which was all part of the popular Brando myth, and uh, which I tried to remember quite keenly, you know, um, um, in uh, then developing the story that that you know he was he, you know he had been the Godfather. He was. Uh, he was a recluse, uh, you know, he put on weight, hadn't he, and wasn't he a bit crazy, and wasn't there something terrible that happened in his house? So, I mean, all these things were true, but, you know, I didn't really know anything about the background, and um, so all of the research was just, um, um, uh, you know, a, a definite learning process, and there were lots of surprises, but the, no the nicest surprise, I guess, was just, you know, really figuring out that, you know, my opinion on him was um, a good one, even knowing all of his negative sides and the flaws in his character, you know, I could understand the, the, the um, well, I got to understand his complexities more and more and, um, and found that, you know, he was a very likable figure. Talk about the civil rights area, this, because this is very, very important. A lot of times you just see one picture of him or maybe one picture of Sammy Davis Jr. Now we're starting to see all these pictures and those icon stuff. They were there when those marches were happening. They really championed the civil rights. Talk about that. Um, yeah, so I, I sat down with um, Harry Belafonte in New York and had a, you know, a 
know, in terms of my preparation, because a lot of it, you know, uh, the, um, no other interviews are in the film, it's all from Marlon's own voice, but I spoke with a good 40 people from his life, um, including people from the, you know, involved in the civil rights cause, especially, you know, Harry. Um, you know, it was something that was really very important to him. He had, um, from a very early age, he asked the question, as is in the film, you know, how am I my brother's keeper? And had a, a deep sense of obligation to be of service to his fellow man. Um, and you'd see that, and he pioneered that entire movement. Now, I mean, it's quite common, we all know that celebrities get involved in um, particular causes and charities and they use their name to good effect. But Brando was really one of the pioneers on that front, and thinking how could he use his fame, which was obviously a curse in many respects, how could he actually you know, use that to, um, uh, as a, good, a force for good? Talked about something that surprised you. What was it that surprised you about him? Um, uh, just, I mean, all, all sorts. I mean, I just realizing, just finding out the humanity. You know, I mean, he obviously was, you know, as far as he was popularized in the media, um, you know, he was this mythic figure and he was, you know, this, um, this prized celebrity, this hunted um, uh, figure, you know, who was the uh, main catcher of the paparazzos. And, and you know, not really, he was never, you know, he, he wasn't, um, um, uh, I just found it, I, 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 I really enjoyed the stages for just understanding, in fact, how kind of ordinary and personable he was, mm -hmm. and how smart a guy he was, how, how connected a guy he was, that even though he had um, um, all manner of problems in, uh, that he was trying to figure out uh, through therapy and um, uh, self-analysis, that um, you know that he was he was you know, he was afflicted by the same uh, insecurities that we all have, um, and very honest about them. And um, uh, you know, I just find him, I found him to be really in, in, uh, insightful and uh, perspicacious. And you know, that was um, I mean, that's speaking generally. There were lots of surprises in that in that sense. I mean, his honesty was was impressive. Found and then his then his desperation to really get to the core of um, the big answers in life, the big questions. And we know the answers a lot of times with your listening to the tapes. Were you really cognizant of his family and his family estate in picking and choosing the positives over the negatives, things like that, as to not offend a family or, or be careful of that? Um, I, I, yeah, I know what you mean, and even from the very get-go, I mean, because I know when the, when the idea for the documentary was first touted, I think that, that the, um, the the estate was sort of you know hoping that it would be you know a celebration of Marlon's life, a, you know, in, in you know, something to keep his legacy alive. So when I was already coming back with the first proposal, it was it was you know just tiptoeing into these areas about you know um, some of the more uh, I mean. Uh, more difficult sides of Marlon's character um, and difficult events within his life, whether that was the, the, the killing within the household, um, whether that was his um, addictions, his relationships with women. I mean, all of this was kind of personal stuff, but it had to be in the, in the first proposal um, just to... Um, yeah, to make it real, and also, you know, so that there would be no surprises come the very end of the film when it was presented, and, and the, the family and the estate didn't see the film until the very end. And um, when the cut was largely finished, there had to be some reconstruction hadn't gone in yet, but the story was down. And um, and they, um, you know, very, well, thankfully, uh, didn't ask to change anything. When it comes to younger actors who may not know who Marlon Brando was or even is, what, what kind of advice do you have for them and from this movie that they hope to see coming out? I think, you know, for them to, um, that they'll, that there's, there's lots of lessons to find out, even in the film, which isn't, it's not focused on, you know, the, the uh, acting technique, but there's a lot of information in there, a lot of information on his approach to characters. Um, so I think there's, um, it's, it should be a fascinating um, uh, tutorial for, for any actors, even watching the film. But I think just to discover what made Marlon unique as an actor, I think there were many things that combined. I mean, obviously he had fantastic looks and you know physique, and was you know ideal to be a, a leading man. But the fact that he brought, he that he, he transformed perceptions of what the leading man would be. People always credit the fact that he broke his nose as as, um, as bringing in a little bit of imperfection that made him sort of more um, um, a 
appealing to um, uh, you know, a, a, a wider audience, unless obviously um, this um, that star figure, but also he, he brought in insecurity into his acting style. He, he showed vulnerability for the first time. Showed that the leading men, you know, uh, didn't have all the answers. Uh, that they they could be, you know, they could be. Um, um, uh, you know, sensitive and, and vulnerable. Um, I think, uh, and, and forgive me because I'm going through all the things which I, you know, I, I, I think make him exceptional. I think his bravery, the fact that he took on risks that many, many actors just wouldn't even dream of in, then or now. Um, uh, he, you know, he, when he, he tried to play characters that were so far outside his comfort zone, you know, where he had to adopt, where he chose to adopt an entire new accent, um, um, uh, set of mannerisms and play things that were outside of his own culture, whether playing a German young lion, some Mexican Vivas Pata, Englishman on many occasions, uh, several occasions he had, uh, Italian-American in The Godfather, South African um, in um, Dry White Season. I mean, every time he would just try, he, just, he, would, he, he wouldn't just play himself in every part, he, he'd make that leap. And there was a real bravery there, and I just don't see it. I just don't see it in any other actor, really. You really adapted the Stella Adler method way of acting, and I, yeah. loved, I loved your highlight in that of, of her work and how he learned from her. And I loved the depiction of, of going in with the war veterans and learning their um, who had been who mm -hmm. lost their limbs and doing the workouts with them. And I, it seems like he was one of the first actors to do that yeah, at that time. He was, and he would. Um, um, he was very, very studied in his craft. Mm -hmm. People sort of, you know, think that he just would wing it and turn up and um, and and didn't um, apply himself properly. But um, it was quite the opposite. You know, I mean, that was one of the interesting things when I was doing the research. Just realizing exactly how thorough he was and how he took in his mind with all sorts of detail, detail that he would never even need or use, but it was all there and stored up so that you know, once he you know, switched his brain off, it was all available for the spontaneous mind and he could improvise and be, you know, in the moment because he was so well studied and he'd, you know, filled his, um, you know, uh, uh, rational mind with enough information. And that's the last question on this. What do you hope the audience gets out of this, seeing this movie? Um, I very much hope that they kind of see Marlon for who he was, you know, and, he, and, and that it might just um, do away with many of those enduring myths um, that I spoke about, about him being insane or being uncultured and ignorant and, um, um, you know, uh, 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 and someone with whom, you know, you'd find it difficult to relate to because I found it to be completely opposite. I like people to, to discover his humanity and, uh, and, uh, and to be able to take him off the pedestal which he so hated for fame and, and make him ordinary again. Uh, one follow-up to that. Young Marlon or older Marlon as a filmmaker would you like? As a filmmaker? Um, that's that's tricky and, and, and not, to, not as a cop-out, you know, I don't think you can really divorce the two as the film, as the documentary seeks not to. You know, the young Marlon informs the old Marlon and in, and in his own mind they're inextricably linked that, that you know, he was quite forward in the sense that he think we're, we're all the products of our own experiences. But, um, uh, you know, I think he, I, I, um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have, a, I wouldn't have a, a choice on that. I think he was talented in bringing something different in whatever phase. You know, he never lost his child boyishness, his childlike um, approach. Um, he, was always, he was the man child, so you kind of had both at every point. <laughs> you know, you had that. Innocence and reflection and intelligence, it was all there. Thank you, appreciate it. Good movie. No problem. Thank you, Stephen.